Gustav Heinrich Ralf von Königswald made sure that his unique collection of fossil hominins survived the Second World War and the Japanese occupation of Java. Original specimens in Bandung were replaced by perfectly coloured plaster casts. The originals were buried in milk bottles in the garden. The complete collection made it to Utrecht, where von Königswald took over the chair of paleontology at the university in 1948. Twenty years later, in 1968, he was appointed head of department paleoanthropology at Senckenberg, Frankfurt. Forty years earlier, Franz Weidenreich, who was opposed to the Nazi ideology, worked here, but had to emigrate to China in 1934. Paleoanthropology in Frankfurt did not recover until the Werner Reimers Foundation gave it a new chance in Frankfurt. The Reimers Stiftung became involved due to lucky coincidence. On the one hand, there was Gustav Heinrich Ralf von Königswald, about to be retired as professor in a Dutch university. On the other hand, the foundation was established right in those years around 1963 to 65. Its first director then was a previous colleague of Königswald's named Helmut de Terra. So he took the initiative by addressing Königswald and inviting him to come here to Frankfurt, Bad Homburg, bringing his collection to, just in order to carry on his research, despite any retirement. And uh, luckily enough, Königswald agreed to do so. Von Königswald returned large parts of his collection to Indonesia in the 1970s, including the Mojo Kerto and Gangdong skulls. Privately funded discoveries from Sangiran became property of the Werner Reimers Foundation after von Königswald's death in 1982. Jens Franzen, his successor, organized a von Königswald memorial conference at Werner Reimers Foundation in Bad Homburg 1984 that featured a veritable who's who in the world of paleoanthropology at the time. Today, the Gustav Heinrich Ralf von Königswald Hominin Collection at Senckenberg Research Institute Frankfurt is open for research to colleagues from all over the world. Many famous scholars delivered the Gustav Heinrich Ralf von Königswald lecture that started on von Königswald's 100th birthday in 2002. Elke, you are the only one of us who knows von Königswald personally because you worked with him for a long time. Yes. Can you tell me uh, how he was and what has changed since then? In the beginning, the work in the department what was characterized by the unusual personality of Professor von Königswald. This was connected with a large number of visitors from all over the world. And for me, with wonderful, lovely, and philanthropic stories. Because you organized the Königswald lecture since years. What did you think make the lecture so special? In 18 lectures so far, a number of key researchers in the field of paleoanthropology have given insights into f fantastic sites and their research. And that means that for nearly two decades now, um, this event has inspired more than 300 students, laymen, young scientists and researchers every year. Meanwhile, the Gustav Heinrich Reif von Königswald lecture is an institution, far beyond Frankfurt. These two posters uh, are especially interesting for me. Uh, they are from the lectures held by Nina Jablonski and Francis Thackeray and they show the great diversity of human life in past and present. They both symbolize our convictions. Von Königswald was convinced that Europe was neither the biological nor the cultural centre of human origins. Humanity was only successful because large migrations took place during our deep history. 
In 2008, Senckenberg Paleoanthropology, together with Tübingen University, started a 20-year research project on the role of culture in early expansions of humans, funded by the Heidelberg Academy of Sciences. Rocky is a multidisciplinary research project at the interface between the cultural and natural sciences. Around 3.3 million years ago, our ancestors started to use snapped stone tools with sharp edges. It is an example of the use of a tool to produce tools to solve a problem, a concept not documented so far in the behavioral repertoire of chimpanzees. This innovation had deep impact on human evolution. It represents a crucial step in the development of behavior by decoupling problems and immediate solutions. This increased distance allowed deeper forms of cooperation, facilitated social learning and broadened the range of possible resources. Human evolution struck a new, truly biocultural path with an unprecedented expansion of the range of ecological niches. Based on increasing behavioral flexibility, as well as growing developmental velocity and plasticity, the genus Homo was able to expand out of Africa several times. Human evolution is not only a matter of fossil bones and teeth. We are products of biology and culture. Whereas Rocky studies aspects of biocultural evolution, our human ethology film archive deals with biocultural diversity of humans. It is the world's most comprehensive scientific documentation of everyday life and social interaction in five societies, recorded by Irineus Eibel Eibesfeld and colleagues since 1969. The films provide evidence for both biocultural diversity and universality, variability of behavior as well as universals and expressive behavior, universal strategies of social interaction or value systems shared by all humans. Since the same families and neighborhoods were visited repeatedly over up to 50 years, this is a unique record of individuals' life histories and the history of their societies. So this is an exceptional database for both natural sciences and the humanities. But the films are not only interesting for science, but also for the individuals and the societies involved. And they are of global significance as irretrievable testimonia of cultural history and diversity. And they provide excellent foundations for intercultural understanding. Any work with the archive requires cooperation with the societies involved. For instance, we have to make the films available for them, have to discuss possibilities of archive use, and have to include their views into any future plans for the archive. One aim of the Film Archive is to identify universals among all humans living today. But what about the differences? We know today there's nothing primitive or advanced in humans, unless you deliberately chose to see it that way. Skin colour, for example, is as diverse as the over 7,000 languages, yet simple to explain. UV radiation destroys folic acid and supports build-up of vitamin D. The optimal skin pigmentation corresponds to the respective local radiation intensity of UVB for maintaining the necessary balance. The question often arises, are biological races real? The short answer is no. Biological races have never existed in nature. Some groups have been isolated for periods of time in our history, but there has always been some mixing and continuity. Just because races aren't biologically real, however, doesn't mean that races aren't real for people. We have created races in our heads and in our societies through our belief systems and culture. We live in a racialized world of our own making. Regardless of where we live, we belong to a remarkably closely related family of human beings who share common values of love, compassion, and playfulness, and abilities to reason and think about what came before us and what will come after us. The story of human evolution gives us a mirror into ourselves. Anthropological sciences were often based on racism. 
One assumption was that Africa can impossibly be the cradle of humankind. Another, that some humans today are more primitive than others. Racism led to the definition of races, which we use to justify everything from suppression to exploitation and from colonialism to genocides. Racism was probably one of the most powerful European inventions and dramatically shaped human existence during the last few hundred years. While today we celebrate our bicultural diversity as humans and we acknowledge that there is no biological reality of race, the biological and social consequences of racism are real and are ongoing. In our discipline particularly, researchers' early complicity in racist agendas has had a profound effect on our recruitment efforts. Physical anthropology was built on the false concept of the biological authenticity of race and its supposed essentialist reality. At its inception in the early 1900s, the field was defined as the study of human race and their subdivisions. Researchers at the time were really preoccupied with studying skulls of the other and their findings were used politically to support policies based on scientific racism. Homo sapiens is bioculturally diverse regionally and even locally, but its highest diversity is hidden. Our thoughts and feelings, experiences and fears, everything that makes us uniquely human. There are as many answers as humans on Earth to the question, what does it mean to be human? That's a question only a human would ask. Scientifically speaking, the definition of the genus Homo is still a work in progress. Human is a general term that we can apply to the fossil record of the last one and a half million years. Being human to me means being able to question where we come from. Being deeply entangled with the surrounding world, socially, materially and mentally. Curiosity to others, what others are thinking, what others are doing. A curiosity about the world. To be able to be empathetic and compassionate. So with the ability to spread all across the globe, to live in all kinds of climates and environments. To act ethically, to plan and to think about the future. As expansion and complexity of the brain, language and complex tool use. It means to create, to learn and to explore. Using our unique and complex cognitive capabilities to develop a deeper, broader, more meaningful understanding of the world around us. Being aware that there is an infinite universe and we are not more important than a speck of dust in this context. Being human means sharing your thoughts, ideas and fear while sustaining tolerance, diversity and nature for a common future. To be human means to know that there was a time without humans and to be able to get a ceiling for this very long history of the Earth and the rather short period of human existence. To be human for me means being part of humankind and being able to love taking interest in other beings, in other people. And until we embrace the notion that we are a single species, sharing a small, fragile planet whose fate depends on our actions. Being human means being aware of the complex web of genealogy that connects me with all other living beings on Earth, past and present.